Hi. Well, thank you and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Abigail Dotson. Do you prefer Abigail or Abby or what? Abby. Abby. Okay, perfect. Oh, I'm introducing her in her own words. So Abby says, after several years as a teacher, I became a mom in 2002 and recognized the need for a career change. And as a single mom with a child to care for, real estate seemed like a practical move. And as it turned out, it combined my love of art, business, and community service. My lawyer brain loved this challenge of strategy and the adrenaline of the deal. The teacher in me thrived on holding my client's hand through each step of the transaction. Similarly to how I engaged with my students, I've always enjoyed giving my clients an abundance of one-on-one -on -one time and to answer each and every question they have during the length of our working relationship and beyond. I understand the importance that each transaction holds for my clients and commit to every deal with sincerity and focus. And finally, the artist in me appreciated the opportunity to spend my days visiting the varied, interesting homes that make up the landscape I had spent my entire lifetime wandering. Thank you. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about No Us Without ULA, which is the organization we're going to be sponsoring with this talk? Sure. Uh, no Us Without You is a nonprofit organization that uh, helps provide food security to the undocumented immigrants who basically create the backbone of our hospitality industry here. And they're an organization I'm just starting to work with. My company, I, I um, founded and run a small residential real estate company that I own. And part of our, um, like built into our company is uh, supporting the grassroots organizations that we really believe in. And so they're one of the organizations that we're starting to work with and donate on on um, after every transaction closes. So that's, that's so neat. Yeah, and as somebody who's born and raised in LA, and I feel like pretty much everywhere in this country, like didn't we all work in a restaurant at some point in time or a hotel, and like you know really see how the you know the back of the house, the people who you don't see every day, are the people who are so essential to yeah. you know, making that run well and getting us all our jobs and making everything happen yeah totally. absolutely no it, it's a great organization and i hadn't heard about it before so this is awesome it's one of the neat things about this so what would you like to tell us about real estate oh gosh okay well you know, when we started talking, when Pam and I started talking about this, the idea was sort of, um, I know a lot of the format of these Genius Tea Times is just about sort of talking about something you could talk about for 40 minutes mm -hmm. off the cuff. And I certainly could talk about real estate for 40 minutes off the cuff. I've had 20 years of doing it. My trajectory was very um, uh, sort of accidental. And um, I've also made a lot of discovery in the, you know, as I've as my journey through real estate has continued. But I also know that one of the things that I find so often in my business, you know, it's been 20 years that I've been doing this, um, is that it's it's such a huge undertaking for people to buy or sell a house, whether it's your first house or your third house, it's not something people are participating in every day, unless you're me. And and it changes. The landscape changes. The way it's practiced changes, the rules change, the loans change, all of these different pieces change and it's complicated and it feels overwhelming. And I get so many questions from people all the time. And also I think um, it's very alien to a lot of people. So there's uh, there's sort of a, a, a paralysis sometimes around like, I don't even mm -hmm. know where to start. I don't know what question to ask. And a concern if you don't have a direct line or connection to it of like, who do I even ask? and if I call this person, are they going to be like trying to talk me? You know, there's a trust issue. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, I, I got into real estate about 20 years ago when I became a single mom. I My background is in education. I worked, um, you know, from the time I was in high school, running after school programs and summer programs and then student taught all through college. I'm certified as a birth doula and as a childbirth educator. I started midwifery school and I never finished. Um, in my mid twenties, I was on my way to graduate school. I was going to go to UCLA and get a master's in education and work on, uh, policy reform and curriculum development when I found out I was pregnant and, um, 
you know, soon after became a single mom and was, you know, living in my childhood bedroom with my young infant daughter and trying to figure out like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? <laughs> what is this going to look like? And what am I going to do in the interim? And after many late night phone calls with my best friend, we kind of pared it down to a real estate or court reporter. At the time, I, I, you know, I had nothing. I had no wealth. I had never bought or sold a home. I didn't have a retirement account. I didn't have, you know, insurance. It was all very Glengarry Glen Ross to me, but it was something that I could do without a significant financial or time commitment. And that mm. gave me flexibility. It's a lot, you see a lot of moms get into real estate because you, you do have flexibility about mm. when you can work and how you can work and, and you make money. So, you know, you get the best of both worlds in that way. Um, I got into real estate thinking it was like something I was going to do for a very short period of time, thinking it was probably my impression of it was that it was like a cutthroat business transactional kind of situation. And, you know, I quickly learned that it, it, there was a real need for like um, somebody with a lot of the skills that I had as a teacher, like patience and um, being able to educate and talk people through transactions, being able to answer questions. Sometimes the same question 10 times comes up because it's confusing and you forget and it's hard and, and, and also like having some uh, understanding that every 90% of the people who are involved in a real estate transaction as a buyer or a seller, it's scary. It's, it could be $200,000 or $2 million or $20 million. It's still the, you know, um, as a ratio to what you have and own in your life, it's, you know, the biggest transaction that you're doing. And so- yeah you know, having somebody that you can really trust and who also understands it and knows what they're doing is important. Um, so that I, I just, you know, quickly started to really enjoy doing it and it's turned into a career at this point and also something that I really believe in um, because it provides such opportunity for you to live your life the way that you want to live it if you can sort of start like I'm 48 years old um I bought my first house in 2007 so I want to say I was in my early 30s I can't remember um and it really was a gateway to being able to leverage that into you know other houses and other mm. kinds of investment opportunities that have given me the security to feel like I have what I need and I'm not, you know, I don't live my life paycheck to paycheck. I don't live stressed out. I know that if there's something that I need, I can leverage that wealth against, you know, sending my daughter to college or, you know, creating, just creating what I want to create. Um, so, you know, I kind of go back and forth. I could, I could talk a lot about like some of my ideas about how real estate specifically is different than stocks or insurance or other things and how it's kind of a gateway to creating that stuff too. Um, but I'm also happy to answer questions if questions come up um, specifically. Uh, and I also can talk about what it really looks like to jump into the market in LA right now. Um, I get a lot of questions because there's so much information circulating right now about yeah. market transitioning and is it a good time to buy is it a bad time to buy I was just talking to somebody today about how you know when there's a known precedent there's an expectation from both sides of what it's going to look like uh, a year and a half ago everybody came in knowing that there were it was going to be competitive the buyer knew they were going to pay more than what the price was the house was listed at. The seller knew they were going to get more than what the house was listed at. Everybody agreed about that and walked away from the transaction knowing that, but it was hard. Now there's a lot of different kinds of information circulating. So, you know, you've got buyers who are hearing um, interest rates are up and there's less buyers in the market. And, you know, so their expectation is that they'll get a better deal, but you have sellers hearing that there's no inventory and things are really competitive and yeah, interest rates are up from where they were, but they're still very reasonable. So they're expecting that they're going to get a lot of money and it, you know, it creates for a lot of confusion. Uh, so I guess 
you know, part of my idea today was maybe to talk about a little bit about like what it looks like. When That'd be great. Going into the market. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit different if you're a buyer or a seller. I think I'll start with what it looks like to be a buyer. Um, a lot of buyers these days originate on Redfin or Zillow or one of the third-party websites, right? So um, people are always keeping an eye at stocking real estate and um, going to open houses on themselves. Back when I started, you didn't know what was available and what was open without talking to your realtor. We had exclusive access to the compilation of listings, the MLS, which is where all the realtors, you know, the the database that collects all the realtors' um, uh, listings. And then that was only available to realtors specifically. Now hmm. you've got all these third-party websites that call that data. And as soon as something gets listed on the MLS, it gets drawn to Redfin, Zillow, Realtor, all those other places. So as buyers, you guys are able to look at things, see something that you like, go to an open house, maybe decide that you love it, and then call your best friend and say, "Who? I, I love this house. Who was your realtor? And you get a phone call. Um, the conversation that I have with buyers sort of nuts and bolts from the very beginning who call me is like a 101 about what is this going to look like? What are your protections? How do we go about getting you a house? Uh, and so I could give a little bit of that information now, which I think is helpful. That would uh, be great. Okay, cool. So let's say you find a house on Redfin and you call a realtor. First thing I'm going to tell you is do not click that link on Redfin or Zillow or realtor.com or anywhere else that says, you know, I'd like to see this house connect me with a realtor. Because as soon as you do that, what you're doing is not connecting with the listing agent, but connecting with some realtor who advertises through that database mm -hmm. and is then mm -hmm. selecting mm -hmm. it as the person that you get referred to. You now created, um, uh, uh, this person now is your first access to the house and becomes your realtor in that case. So you have a lot less, uh, like autonomy around like going to see it, deciding you love it, and then wanting to use somebody that you know, or that you've heard of. And a lot, I get calls all the time from clients who are like, well, I just, I, I just didn't want to bother you. So I just, you know, I went and don't do that because you, you create a relationship. It's a contract basically. So go to an open house. That's fine. Um, but if you see something that you like, or you see something that you want to get an appointment to contact your realtor or somebody, you know, you trust that you think you might want to use as a realtor to get you that appointment. Say you go to the house, you love the house, you want to write an offer on it. Writing an offer is uh, daunting, but really simple. As realtors, we do it with our eyes closed. It takes me five minutes. So I always tell my clients, don't, don't worry about wasting my time. And sometimes just the practice of going through it is important because the more times you do it, you know, the easier it gets. Um, your, your offer is going to include not just the price that you're offering to pay for the property, but also a whole other list of terms and conditions that you're offering, most important of which are your contingencies. As a buyer in California, you have three main contingencies to your offer, meaning that when you write an offer on a property, you're saying, I want to buy this house for a million dollars, but I'm going to buy it contingent on these three things. So if you accept my offer, three things have to happen in order for the sale to go through. One is that the property has to appraise for the value that I agreed to pay for it. So an appraisal is a third party um, uh, valuation of the property that's required by the bank. That's because the bank is investing in your purchase, assuming you're getting a loan. If you're not getting a loan, you don't need an appraisal. If you're getting a loan, your bank is going to order an appraisal from a, from a regula government-regulated third-party company who's going to come in and assess the value of the home and basically go back to the bank and say, yep, they're buying it for a million dollars. It's worth a million dollars. So that way, if you default on your loan and the bank has to foreclose later, they know that they're going to be able to recoup whatever their investment in it was. All right. So the property has to appraise for the value that you agreed to pay for it. The second one is that your loan has to be underwritten. One of the first things that you really want to do as a buyer coming into a competitive market, really any market, because it's information for you anyway, is to get pre-approved by a lender. Um, and so that pre-approval says, okay, yes, I have reviewed your taxes, I've pulled your credit, and you know, I'm 90% sure that you're going to get approved for this loan. 
But once you actually open escrow and you have a price and a property, at that point in time, your file goes to an underwriter who goes through every single transaction on every single bank statement, credit card statement, brokerage account for the last year usually. They're gonna look at you know, your visas if you're not American, they're gonna look at, they're gonna um, you know, confirm that your employment, they're gonna look at every, everything. They're gonna ask you for explanations on why there's a $5,000 uh, debit or credit to your bank account. So it goes through that whole process. They make, they vet it and make sure that you're still a pretty, a good borrower, somebody that they can trust and that they can package and that, um, hmm. you know, they can sell to Fannie and Freddie on the secondary market. Uh, and as long as that happens, your loan will be approved. But if for some reason during that process, they flag something or you lose your job or just for some reason they decide at the end of the day, actually, no, you're not, we're not going to approve you for this loan. That's your second contingency and says, I don't have to move forward with this process if I don't get approved for this loan at the end of the day. Your third one, a most important one, is called your buyer's investigation contingency. And that is the one that protects you no matter what. So it's an umbrella contingency that says, as a buyer, you have the right to investigate this property as much as you want. And if for any reason during that time you decide this is not your property, you can walk away from it. So that's when you do your physical inspections. Right, so you're gonna have a general inspector come and evaluate all the systems of the property. You may decide you need a more specific look at the foundation or the roof or whatever. But in addition to that, you're gonna make sure this is the house that you want. Um, I always tell my clients, go sit in front of the house at night. It's a very different house at night than it is during the day. What are the neighbors doing? I say, knock on the neighbor's doors and introduce yourself. You wanna make sure that these are people that you, you wanna live next door to because I don't care how great the house is. If you hate your neighbors, it's miserable. Um, I And neighbors also know more about your house than anybody else does. And they'll give you more information, you know? And important things sometimes, I've had people find out that somebody had 32 cats living in their house, which may not seem like such a big deal, except for if you've got 32 cats living in your house and somebody just put new floors down, it makes you question why, what's going on under, you know? Mm -hmm. and, it can be, you know, it could be massive. Like we've had people had to take out all their floors and subfloor because of cat oh, pee. No. Right. Oh no, that's terrible. <laughs> it is. It is, right? And there's nothing like like being so excited that you just closed escrow on the house of your dreams, moving in and starting to do the little renovations and finding out that, you know, someone hid something from you or there was something unknown and you know we can only find out as much as we can by without tearing down walls while we're in escrow so uh, you know so if for any reason you decide that that's not the house for you you also you know are you going to get into the school that you want to get into is how far is your commute to work um how much is it going to cost for you to do the renovations you want to do is it affordable uh, is there another house that you just like better? These are all totally reasonable ways that you can get out of that escrow during that contingency period. So the contingency period is negotiated when you're offering. It could be anywhere from non-existent. You can drop it completely if you feel comfortable doing that and you and your realtor decide that it's a really competitive property and this is how you're going to lock it down. To the default in the contract is 17 days, but we rarely see 17 days of contingencies unless there's a real reason, if it's a farm or something like more than just a house in LA that you're gonna explore. Usually it's between one to two weeks. And that one to two weeks, whatever your, each contingency is defined separately. So you could have three days for loan, seven days for appraisal and 12 days for buyer's investigation. They all run concurrently at the same time, and they all start on day zero of your contract starting. So if I'm a buyer and I see a house and I write an offer on it and the seller accepts my offer, the date that the seller accepts it is day zero. If it's a 30-day mm. escrow, which is very common, um, it means that on day 30, the house is mine. That's calendar days, not business days, all right? So they accept it on day zero, 30 days later, the title records and the property is mine as long as day 30 lands on a business day. If day 30 lands on a weekend or a holiday, then it moves to the next business day. Close of escrow is the only thing that we count 
business days because uh, the recorder's office is not open on the weekends or holidays. So we can't record a title then. Everything else is calendar days. Your contingencies run on calendar days um, and we count your escrow period on calendar days as well. Uh, and then those contingencies will all be, day, they'll all be the same day zero. And as we move through the days, let's say you had 12 days for each of them on day 12, it's expected that you will have completed all of your diligence around all these three things and be ready to remove those contingencies. You remove, at that point in time, you're either gonna remove them and move forward with the deal, or you're gonna say, you know what, we're out, this didn't work for us, and you're gonna cancel and walk away. You, you send a 3% deposit to escrow when you open escrow, that deposit's refundable to you. Mm. Cancel before you've removed contingencies. So you'll get it back. Uh, you'll just be out of pocket for whatever you paid your inspectors. And an inspection, a general, I mean, they vary depending on the size of the house and is there a pool or no pool, a guest house, no guest house, but on your average Northeast LA, you know, 1200 to 1600 square foot house without a pool, you're looking at around 450 to $500 for a general inspection. And then, you know, you usually wanna do a termite and a sewer line. So you're probably looking at around $800 out, off the bat and then a few hundred more if you end up having to do other kinds of inspections. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what it looks like to buy. Um, it's more comp, you know, if you're going to sell, it's it, it, what I just kind of explained is, is more explanatory about as a seller, you know, you're going to market the house as, as your realtor, I'm going to market the house or whoever your realtor is take photographs, you know, often staging your realtor will talk to you about staging. Staging is really actually it's expensive, but it's important if you want to get the most for your money, for your house. Um, but I think the most important thing to know as a seller is that your buyer will have those contingencies. So when you accept an offer or as a buyer, when you get an offer accepted, you're really putting the property on hold um, and saying, nobody else can buy it. I don't have to operate with this like sense of urgency of like, I better just nail this down before someone else gets it. It's mine. And now I have some time to really make sure that this is what I want before I commit to it 100%. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's why you see so many things that say in escrow and suddenly the in escrow thing is removed. Yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. so, so or like back on market or um, you see a lot of um, like contingent if you go on to, that's what they call it. So what if you see it on like Redfin or something and it says contingent, it means they have an accepted offer. It's in escrow generally assuming that the agent is on top of it and changes the status correctly, the buyer has not removed contingencies yet. So it's not a done deal. They're still exploring. I can't accept a new offer, but I could accept an offer as backup. Meaning oh. if this person decides to cancel, we scoot you in and you get to be the new buyer. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's kind of like the in and out of like, the basics. Uh, yeah, the basics. I think, you know, what are some other questions I get a lot? Uh, who pays commission? As a buyer, your agent is free to you. Um, so that's great news. The process is really set up on all fronts to make it as easy as possible for a buyer who's coming out of pocket, you know, and spending their life savings to purchase. So um, both the listing agent and it's confusing, but I'm called the selling agent, are uh, paid by the seller. Okay. So, yeah, we split the commission 50-50 usually. Um, and it, that's usually, it could be anywhere from five to 6% total, depending on who the listing agent is and what they, what they cost. Got um, it. It looks like you get a lot of questions about is now the right time to buy? Is now the right time to sell? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people ask questions about when is the right time, especially as you're looking at, you know, markets going up or going down or transitioning or changing. And what I tell people is that, first of all, if you're buying and selling at the same time, then you're going to be on both sides of the equation. So you're going to buy high and sell high. You're going to buy low and sell low. So it's sort of irrelevant. Um, in terms of like where, where we are right now in this market and where rates are going, you know, I think, um, one of the things that people, I feel like really hyper focus on is the financial investment of buying a house, which is really important. 
because it's a huge financial investment, but it's a holistic thing. If you're buying a primary residence, so let's not talk about income property right now, but if you're buying a home that you're going to live in, there's a lot of different factors to think about. Are interest rates going to go up or down? I mean, nobody has a crystal ball, but Right now, it's pretty generally accepted that they're either going to hover at where they are now in the low sixes or potentially go down just a little bit. If they do go down, though, what's going to happen is it will incite another buying frenzy, likely. So while the interest rates go down, the prices go up because you have more competition, right? So um, I think what I tell people is you never you never know the bottom of the market until it's passed or the top of the market by definition, right? It has yeah. to have passed in order for you to know that you reached that place. But, you know, I, I bought my first house in 2007, months before the market crashed. And my house was worth less a year after I bought it. But as long as you are smart about knowing that you're going to be able to carry that mortgage and not lose your property, through the ups and downs of the real estate market, there's not really a bad time to buy a house in Los Angeles. I still own that house. That house is worth twice what I paid for it and positive cash flows for me right now and is, you know, a big part of my investment portfolio because it's it's a income property, you know. Um, and income property is great on a lot of fronts, being able to have it because not only does it generate income for you, but, you know, one of the awesome things about owning a home is that you can do so many things with it, right? You could, t it's, it's, when you buy Apple stock, you just have Apple stock and the Apple stock is going to go up or the Apple stock is going to go down and hopefully it goes up and it's going to do a little bit of both and you're just going to watch it happen. And that's great. But when you own a house, you could watch the market go up and the market go down. You could pull money out of that house to make money for you and still let the house appreciate and gain money on it, Right. If I want to use my Apple stock money to invest in something else, I have to cash out of Apple mm. and bring it somewhere else. I don't get to borrow the money from my Apple portfolio, but still own that many shares and still watch it continue to rise. I also have um, one of the things I really help clients look at when they're looking to buy a house is what is the unappreciated uh, opportunity there? Right. So even whether or not you decide to capitalize on it, is there a way that you can make this house make money for you? And that could be by remodeling it, by doing an addition to it. Is it in a neighborhood that is above and beyond the general Los Angeles neighborhood, likely to see a massive appreciation? So Highland Park 15 years ago, you know, a great place to buy Silver Lake 20 years ago, 25, whatever, those kinds of things you're looking at. Um, so, uh, you know, and as a homeowner, if you do find yourself in a position where, uh, you know, you're, you've lost your job or you have an emergency situation, income seems tricky, you, you have options, right? You can sell your house, you can rent your house, you can rent out a room in your house, you can, you know, build an ADU and create income stream there. Um, so even more so when you own income property because it's not your primary residence, right? Mm. So you have an additional sort of like, you know, whether just because you feel like doing it or because you encounter some kind of hardship in life and you need that extra money or because you want to buy something else, you have this sort of extra thing that you can sell and still keep your home. Um, God, I don't even remember. Why did we start on this? <laughs> we so it's not the right time to buy. Yeah. So, my, oh, so, so yes, now's the right time to buy if you find the house that you want because the house that you want is your home like there's the income piece of it, which is really great and important. And that's where a smart, good real estate agent is going to help you understand that what you're buying is a solid investment. But beyond that, you're going to live in it. You're going to raise your children in it. You're going to have holidays in it. It's going to create, it's going to be a sanctuary for you. So there's a value to all of that, of a place that you're going to love and want to be in. And beyond that, if you are currently renting and don't own, you're paying 100% interest. You know, every single rent check you write is you're never going to see a penny of that back again. When you buy a house, even if you pay 5% more or 10% more than you would pay for the same house next year, you're getting a tax benefit from the mortgage interest. You are basically paying, you know, 
any part of the principal, you're paying yourself as, you know, uh, as, as uh, equity into, back into the property. Um, and then, you know, one of the allegories I sort of share with people a lot when they're wondering about, did I pay, am I, am I paying too much for this house? Is like, well, you're paying what the house costs. There's no absolute value to a house, right? Houses are worth whatever somebody's willing to pay for them. And that's why we don't have just a sticker price that says this house is $999,000. Um, you know, it depends on who's in the market, how it's advertised. It's worth more to somebody whose parents live down the block or who's can walk their kids to school, whatever, for different reasons. People want to be in different places. So there's something subjective to it. My parents bought their house in Manhattan Beach, five blocks from the beach in 1979 for $100,000. And I, nobody's asking anybody right now, did they pay you know, 10,000, 10% too much for it. And that's like a really true thing. Like if you get so microcosm about it, you forget about the bigger picture, which is like, A, it's my home. I'm living in it. There's a value for that. I love it. And I want to be there. But B, Los Angeles is not a city that's ever going to see more homes than people who need homes, which is sad, but it's true. Which means that while the market does go up and down, it fluctuates. As long as you are confident that you can hold on to it through the downfalls or that you will have enough equity in it that even if you sell, maybe at not the best time in the market, you still will not be upside down. You won't lose money. Um, there's not a bad time to buy a house. The other thing is that, you know, um, the subject of, interest rates comes up a lot lately. Oh, yeah. Everybody's talking about it. So the thing about interest rates is that you could renegotiate them later, right? I can't go back to the seller of a house after I've bought it and say, hey, your values, the value on the house I bought from you has gone down a little bit. So I just, can you give me a little money back? But I can absolutely do that with interest rates. I can go back to the bank if, if so, you know, when people ask me right now about interest rates, I say they're actually very reasonable. You have people coming to you all the time in my business saying they're so high. And it's like, they're like, you clearly weren't trying to buy a house in like 1991 because interest rates were 17%. <laughs> like it's mm -hmm. 6% is a very reasonable interest rate and actually what our country needs in order to maintain some kind of economic stability. Right. Um, but that said, if interest rates go down, you can refinance and get that lower interest rate. If interest rates go up, you have the benefit of being locked in at the lower rate. So it's there's kind of like the conversation about should I wait until interest rates go down? You know, my answer and most of my colleagues is absolutely not. If you see something you like, buy it now. And then if interest rates go down, you refinance and you're not then part of this flurry of people who want to get in really quickly and cause prices to go up. You've locked in at a lower price. Got it. Yeah. So that's a little bit of that. Um, okay. Oh, um, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I had a simple one. What happens when you can't qualify for a loan, but you want to still figure out, are there ways that you can buy property in common, like pool in with other resources? I mean, I know somebody can carry a note for you, but if you don't, for example, have family that is willing to front you that, what are other things that you can try? Yeah. So there are, there are some different options if you don't think you can qualify for loan. So there's a lot of different loan products out there right now. So my my first direction to somebody who asked me that would be to talk, I'd give them a couple of good mortgage brokers. There's a difference between a direct lender and a mortgage broker. A direct lender is somebody who works for a bank, a big bank, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. You go into your bank, you can get pre-approved for a loan. Um, there are very few situations where that's the optimal thing to do because, I mean, for a variety of reasons, but really because... When you go into Chase and you say, I bank with you, I'd like to get pre-approved for a loan, you're going to be offered whatever Chase has. Chase has every, there are a million different products out there and different banks carry different products. Chase also is a big bank. So they're, they're working specifically with the government. Fannie and Freddie 
backed loans, which are more conservative. And, you know, a mortgage broker's job is to take all your information and to package it the right way. And mm. um, it's my job is to take all of the pieces of like what you have to offer and to package it the best way for each particular house that we might be writing an offer on. So mortgage brokers looking at everything, how much money you make, how much debt you have, what your credit scores are, anything outstanding around there. And they're figuring out how do we package this best? And it's actually not as straightforward as you would think. Hmm. So um, a mortgage broker is somebody who works for a smaller company usually and has relationships with all different kinds of banks and also in-house, what we call in-house lenders. And so they might have a little bit more flexibility and different loan programs to try and fit some people creatively into a particular loan program. If you really don't fit, you might be paying a higher interest rate in order to get a loan because you're a higher risk buy borrower, right? There are things called portfolio loans. There's hard money. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned, Laura, there's like co-signing and things like that. Um, FHA loans are actually much more forgiving and easier to get. A mm. lot of people who don't qualify for a conventional type of loan will qualify for FHA loans because your your credit score can be much lower than it can be in a more conventional loan situation. Oh. Um, they allow a lot, there's a lot more allowance for like uh, co-signers and co-borrowers and gift funds and things like that. The only thing is that an FHA loan comes with what's called mortgage insurance because it's a mm -hmm. risk for a loan. It has to be insured. So you end up paying something called mortgage insurance on it, which varies depending on the on how much your loan is. But it's not that, you know, it's hundreds of dollars usually. Um, and then you can refinance out of that mortgage insurance once you have 20% equity in your property. But if all of that fails, there's something called te uh, tenancy in common which I think you sort of alluded to, which is a way that people can get together and like buy property together. So it used to be used in LA sort of specifically for like your best friends and you want to buy a duplex together. How do we buy this duplex together and each live in one unit? And it's still something that we do. It's where each person, you're on the same loan together, but you each have a percent uh, ownership in the property. So you each own 50% in a very basic, uh, sort of outline of what that would look like. But you also see lots of these popping up recently all around LA that are, they're called TIC or TIC sales, stands for tenant in common, um, where a developer has purchased a, usually they're small, like two, four, maybe six unit building. Often they're much more aesthetically pleasing character type, little mm. places in Silver Lake or little cottages in Highland Park. And they, um, when you when you want to convert something into a condominium, it's a lengthy and expensive process. It takes years, you know, one to two years to do. It costs a lot of money, and uh, there's just a lot of hoops you have to jump through. Tenancy in common is slightly different, where you can it, it streamlines the process, and um, the owners are you get your own fractional loan now. So there are only two banks that do it, maybe three, and you can hmm. buy sort of a fractional piece of this bigger property. You guys are all owners together, similar to a condo, but it's just set up a little bit differently. Um, those are, I wouldn't even necessarily say they're easier to qualify for because I don't think they are, but the prices are significantly lower. Um, and mostly that's just because they're newer to our LA market. It's something they've been doing in San Francisco for forever. Uh, yeah. But they're a little bit newer to our market. They're priced a little bit under market. And so in that sense, it's a little easier to get a loan. Anytime, you know, the loan is smaller, it's easier to get. Of course. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Is that something that you have done? Yeah, totally. And I actually even own. I own the cool. first house I was telling you about that was a duplex I purchased in 2007 with very close friends of mine. And we sort of um, wanted to, own an intentional community together. It's actually the people that I know Pam through. Um, so they're a couple I've known forever and they're 
both men and married and I was a single mom and our daughters are, have known each other since birth and we're the same. And we thought let's buy this duplex together and have male and female role models and let our kids wander and be a community and support each other. And so we did, and we bought it as tenants in common. We each own fractional interest in the property as a whole. My life took a different direction. And, you know, five years later, I ended up moving out. They still live there. Um, but I've also sold many of them. I, you know, I'll be honest with you. The, the tick thing is an interesting solution because you do get much more like appealing property. Uh, you're not just in general, they're not like condos can be kind of depressing sometimes or yeah. not aesthetically or architecturally interesting. The tick sales often are like much cuter little buildings, oftentimes have courtyards or small yards um, and they're cheaper. So that part is all great. The, uh, the part that can be challenging for some people is that the way that TIC sales, the, the way that they've become popularized in Los Angeles is through something called the Ellis Act. Mm -hmm. Ellis Act is something that developers have used as like a go around to mm -hmm. like, from having to um, adhere to tenant, tenant rights. So they can LS yeah. Act building, they can kick all the tenants out by removing the units from the rental market for five to 10 years, it depends. But um, as long as they agree that the unit's gonna be removed from the rental market altogether, they can vacate the tenants. They don't have to pay a relocation fee. And, you know, so people have, I, I will say the only ones that I've sold, I always ask the listing agent how the units were vacated because- yeah ethical conversation when you know somebody who's been there for 40 years and doesn't have a regular income and is paying 500 dollars a month gets booted out especially with no relocation so, yeah i've seen that happen to quite a few people uh, and it's horrible yeah it's a it's a you know but that's not always how it's done you know i mean mm. because it, it, the other benefit for an investor is they don't have to go through the one to two year long process of converting something into an actual condominium. You know, it's, it's still a, it's, it's still a viable and exciting uh, way of like buying and selling and developing real estate. Even if you, you know, even better if you purchase the units and they're vacant because then you don't have to remove them from the rental market either. And when you sell it, so one of the things as a, as a buyer of a tick property, if you buy something that has been Ellis acted, you have to know that you can't rent it. You Got it. Time. You can't rent a room in it. You cannot collect income for that property at all for a set amount of time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and bigger developers can afford to wait for that. And a lot of other people might not be able to. Yeah, well, or as a buyer, you come in and, you know, one of the things that a lot of buyers, because when you buy, with the first time you buy a house, you're stretching your income, you know, and it feels scary. It's a big stretch. Um, so a lot of like in the back of their head is like, well, I could always like, I could always rent out a room if I need to, you know, to help make the mortgage. Can't do that in a tick if it's been Ellis acted, um, at least for five years. Got it. <sighs> Um, you did have a question about, can I work with two realtors at a time? And I know somebody who did this and had six different realtors, one for each day. Now, oh. infuriated everybody, of course, but that was also, he was kind of an infuriating person. But, <laughs> um, well, no. You, you, I mean, you could. could. <laughs> but you shouldn't. It's a, you know, I tell people it's a trust-based business. I don't make people sign buyer broker agreements. There are agents who do a buyer. Bro so when I sign a listing agreement with somebody, it's a, it's a contract between the agent and the person who's listing the property. And it says, if you sell your house within this time period, I am owed a commission. And what that does is prevent people from making deals directly with a buyer and saying, well, you, you know, I'll pay a little less for the property and you won't have to pay the commission and we'll cut the realtor out. Cause you know, it's a lot of work. Um, some people make buyers sign what's called a buyer broker agreement. They basically says the same thing. I'm your representation. I'm your agent. If you buy a house, I'm owed a commission. And so if you decide to buy a house and you use a different agent, 
guess what? You have to pay me that commission personally out of your pocket. I do not do that. I think it's like um, most of my clients, not, I mean, I've done it twice in my life. Once because a client literally asked me to recently because she late night clicked that little Redfin button and this Redfin agent would not leave her alone. And she did not want to deal with them. And she only wanted to deal with me. And she called me and said, how do I get, I can't, she won't leave me. I keep telling her I have an agent. She won't participate, you know. And I said, well, let's just sign a buyer broker agreement. And she said, great, let's do it. So we did. So now she's contractually obligated and she can just tell that to the Redfin agent. Um, uh, so I, what I tell people is it's trust. You know, like I'm working hard for you and I don't get paid until you buy something. Doesn't mean you have to buy something. If you decide not to buy something, you decide not to. But it's a bummer if I've worked for four or five or six or 12 months with you hard and then you walk into an open house and write an offer with the listing agent. If at any point in time you feel like this isn't working out, you know, we've, we've got to be able to work together. So I'm never going to hold someone into a deal that they don't feel good about. But yeah, you should really be using two agents unless you disclose it to both agents and they're okay with it. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, if you have some questions, um, you can unmute yourself or if you'd like, you can write it into the chat. Otherwise, I am perfectly happy to continue asking questions. <laughs> um, um, I think you pretty much described what a traditional escrow looks like. Yeah. Um, what if you're trying to sell? What are the sorts of things that you want to do to get your place ready to sell? Oh, gosh. Well, staging um, is a really big thing. Um, so when you're getting ready to sell, you know, hopefully you're going to have a realtor who's going to walk through with you um, and look at all the little things. There's like the the in a perfect world, you're able to in a very perfect world. And this is how you're going to get the most for your property always. Um, even if you have the most beautiful furniture in the world, staging is an art. It draws your eye to the place that it needs to go away from the place that it shouldn't go. When you're living in a house, you tend not to see certain amounts of clutter or things that you've been living with forever. So in a perfect world, you're able to move out of your house, empty it out, start from scratch, have it staged, photographed beautifully um, and marketed beautifully. And that's it. Um, as a realtor, we'll walk through with you and talk about little things. Maybe you need some paint touch up here. Maybe we need to like organize a closet. Maybe we need to deal with some landscaping stuff, things like that. Um, if you're not able to move out like that, then, you know, your realtor is going to walk through with you and kind of talk about like decluttering is the biggest thing because we all live in our houses and like we have stuff in our houses, on our shelves, on our surfaces. You know, even if it's like a beautiful house and you're an interior designer, you still live there with your people. And like yeah. people don't necessarily need to walk through and see, you know, 14 mops in the broom closet because they're going to open up all your closets and your boxes of kids' toys and, you know, whatever. So um, it's really just kind of like um, even little things like getting windows clean, wiping off the dust off light bulbs so that the light is really nice, uh, fixing any like, you know, little pieces of like drywall that might need some replacement or, you know, a window that has a crack in it, just things that are, that are people are going to look at and maybe think like, Ooh, like what else is going on here? You know? Got it. Um, always like curb appeal is the first thing that people see. So like anything we can do to like brighten up your front yard, your front door, you know, get you to like walk into the house. I, I would say like, those are the biggest things that you kind of want to look at. You also need to get rid of anything that feels really personal to you or, or is very important to you or valuable to you because you're going to have people walking through your house and, you know, they not, I'm, certainly it happens that theft happens at open houses, but also somebody brings their three-year-old who, you know, runs into a room and knocks over a ashtray that your kid made you, or I don't know, not, you know, it just happens. You need to walk through and get rid of anything that feels really important to you. That makes sense. Yeah. Just to have a, a cleaner slate. Is that the idea? Yeah. I mean, I mean, think about the houses that you've seen in pictures or in person that you're most drawn to, right? There are houses that look lived in that you can imagine that somebody lives there. You never want to, it's hard to sell an empty house, but mm. there are also houses that kind of wow you. And the, a lot of the wow 
I mean, a lot of it's, it's about beautiful furniture and art and finishes, but it's also about like, you know, not having all the essentials around that we have in our day to day, not having, you know, um, uh, a bunch of, you know, a coffee maker and a Cuisinart and a crock pot on our counter and not having, you know, just that, that stuff. That's, yeah. That you may end up putting back right back into it anyway, but you don't want to necessarily see it. Totally. Yes. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So what first step should people take if they want to, are thinking of diving in and thinking, ending, ending this, going into this world? Yeah. I mean, the very first step is to get, is to get your finances in order. So that's about talking to a mortgage broker and the mortgage broker is going to pre-approve you, but also like a lot of people have an idea about what they think they can afford. Uh, a mortgage broker is going to tell you what you can actually afford, which might be more or less than what you think. Mm. Maybe you qualify for more than what you're comfortable with, but that's really the starting point because without that, it's hard to determine what you should even be looking at. So getting pre-approval pre doesn't cost you anything. And I always, you know, tell people, reach out to me. I'm going to give you three or four different names, all great people. It's a relationship. So like talk to them and see who you jive with. Um, but they'll, they'll kind of run your preliminary information and give you an idea of what kind of loan you'd be pre-approved for, but also what that loan is going to cost you every month. That's great. Yeah. And because I know that having somebody good who can actually say, put in, you know, any um, property taxes as part of your mortgage and um, combining some of the home insurance as part of that makes a big difference because that can be a terrible surprise bill for people. Yes. Really, really important. So when you're talking with a mortgage broker and a good mortgage broker should be telling you this anyway, what you want to know is certainly like what the interest rate is and what that translates to in dollars. But also we call it a, it's called a PITI payment, which is principal interest taxes insurance. That's what you're in every month. That's your all in every month. What is the principal and interest on my mortgage plus the monthly ta property taxes plus the insurance. If you want to figure it out yourself, property taxes are estimated at one and a quarter percent of your purchase price annually. So spread that out over 12 months. Um, and it's a straight 1% for California. Every house in California gets charged a 1% property tax. We say 0.25 because that's approximately what each individual city or neighborhood charges. It could be 0.23, it could be 0.27, but 1.25% annually is a really good estimator of what your property taxes are gonna be. And then your homeowner's insurance, you know, that can vary depending on the, obviously the size of the house and where it is, if it's in a high fire zone or something like that. But your typical house in the flats of Highland Park or Eagle Rock, you know, you're probably going to estimate about $150 a month on. And then you also remember that your mortgage interest is a tax deduction, right? So that's really important to factor in if you're going from renting to owning. You don't get any deduction when you're renting. When you own a property, the mortgage interest, the taxes and insurance are tax deductible. And the way that... Um, the way, the way that mortgages are set up through what's called an amortization schedule um, really works in the benefit of a buyer because what happens is those, the, 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 your, if, you are, if you have a 30-year fixed loan, your, your monthly payment is going to be the same every single month for 30 years. However, how that money is distributed changes over the course of the loan. So in month one, year one, let's say, if your payment is $5,000, maybe 4,500 of that is all going towards the interest and 500 is paying down the principal. And that might seem a little counterintuitive because you want to get the principal paid down, but that 500 is not tax deductible. So as a new buyer, when you're feeling really stretched financially, you're getting the benefit of that full, whatever it is. I, don't quote me on these numbers, but 4,500 or $4,000 a month of interest. Slowly over the life of the loan, those change positions. So by year 30, 500 is interest and 4,500 is paying the last of the principal on that loan. No, and that makes a big difference too, if you're thinking, okay, all my interest payments are now tax deductions. Yeah, because you talk to your 
your CPA and usually they can give you a very concrete number that says you're going to if you're if you're a salaried employee you're going to change the deductions on your W2. If you're an independent contractor, you own your own business, self-employed, you're going to change what your uh, quarterly estimated taxes are. But your accountant will be able to say to you, I mean, I just went through this with a client. You literally, when you buy this house, your paycheck is going to increase by $400 a month. You know, so that translation between, oh, I thought I could only afford you know, $3,000 a month on a mortgage, I can actually afford 3,400 because I'm going to get that extra money. Got it. And I really appreciate you saying about what a trust-based thing is, because I have worked with some uh, real estate agents who are not, and who then ended up having fights. So who the real oh, estate yeah. agent who's the seller versus the, it was yeah. messy, messy yeah. and terrible. And most of the information doesn't come through. But it's people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully, whoever you're working with, you feel confident enough in their ability that, like, you don't feel like you need to talk to three different people or two different people. If you do, then it probably means you're not using the right realtor. Um, you know, the only time that that really comes in play in my business anymore is if somebody's looking in various, you know, maybe they're deciding whether or not they want to live in L.A. or Carmel, you know. And then obviously I'm not going to be their realtor up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be hard for you to do that unless you start knowing some places there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Got it. Well, no, this is great and really informative. Thank Good. you so much. Yeah. Um, did uh, is anyone else have another question? Nope. Um, I think for me that answers pretty much everything I have thought of and more. Oh, that's um, awesome. <laughs> so thank you. That's really, really helpful and informative and clear. Um, and also just really nice to sort of hear your attitude towards all of it because, you know, it's not a given, I think. Um, so as somebody <laughs> who's looking to potentially buy in the next few years, that's like something that I'm paying attention to. Um, Good. I'm glad. Like, hopefully you'll still be around doing this. <laughs> I can uh, give you a call and say, you know, you never met me, but I I heard your, your talk. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I look forward to it. You know, one other thing I just want to throw out there is that um is that, you know, there if you there's a the one of the biggest things you hear about in LA. I may have said this, I may have not, but one of the biggest things I hear about for 20 years, like it's this is consistent, is you know I make a lot of money monthly, but I don't have a down payment. So mm -hmm. I just I think a lot of people hesitate because they feel like they don't have the money for a down payment. And I would say, you know, it it depends on where we are in the state of real estate and and what your needs are, how flexible you are with what you're open to buying. Um, but certainly that shouldn't stop you right there. There's more exploring to do. There are ways around that. You know, there are very, there are opportunities for very small down payment type loans, um, and ways to kind of get in and get your foot in the door. Um, even if you don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or even a hundred thousand dollars sitting around. Okay. That's really good to know because I, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know? okay and the way that you get a few hundred thousand dollars is by getting a house and then right. selling it five or ten years later and that's where people you know sort of originate a lot of times that big um nest egg you know that then mm -hmm. then that allows you to go out and like really have some money to play with when you're buying your next house Amazing. got it that is a perfect point, in fact, <laughs> to end this on. Thank you so much for being part of this. Um, and for those people who will be watching this recording later, please, um, how can they find you? Oh, well, you can find me. So my company is called Hearth LA, H-E-A-R-T-H-L-A. And our yep. website is hearthla.com. Um, my email is just my name, abigail at abigaildotson.com. A B I G A I L at A B I G A I L D O T S O N dot com. 
And I take phone calls too. 310-210-0940. And I'm always happy just to chat. I do it all the time. Like I'm not, I don't, I feel like so many people are scared to make the phone call because they don't know what to expect. But like, you know, I'm happy just to chat and answer questions and, you know, no pressure. Very cool. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Okay. Thank you.